Pitch. I'm in Piccadilly in the middle of London. Uh, it's freezing, but I don't mind because I think I'm going to have a really memorable night. Um, I'm meeting Terence Stamp, one of my favourite actors, a kind of cult figure in cinema. I, I like him so much because he was a maverick. He chose his own way in movies. He got fed up with movies in a way, yeah, and he was incredibly beautiful. He had these great eyes. He worked with actors like Marlon Brando, Julie Christie, Robert Redford, Laurence Olivier, and he tries to work with the best directors. He worked with Schlesinger, with Ken Loach, with Michael Camino, with the great Italians Fellini, Pasolini. What we're going to do is he's going to come here, we're going to walk down to Fortnum and Masons, which is closed. We're going to have the run of the place. We're going to sit down and watch clips from his films and talk about them. We're going to film it and you're going to see it. Here's a taxi, this might be him. It is him, I think. Hey, hello. Hi, Lovely to see you. Thanks for coming. Pleasure. Good. The reason why um, I wanted to meet you here uh -huh. is because of this bit in your book where you write this incredibly evocative thing about being in the centre of London for the first time. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was a messenger boy. I was working in Cheapside. Yes. And I came to deliver a package and I came on the underground and got out at Green Park. And I looked across and saw those telephone boxes on a yeah. fruit store and what I now know to be the Ritz. Yeah. And as I saw it for the first time, I had this really, I guess it was my first sort of real deja vu experience. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just, I knew that I had never been here, but at the same time, there was a sense of extraordinary familiarity. Yeah. It was and a really profound thing. And uh, I only understood much later in my life that somehow I was destined to be here. So then what happened? You set up a flat with Michael Caine. The meetings with Mike Caine didn't happen immediately. I yeah. mean, I, when I left home, I came and I lived in a basement with a couple of other would-be actors yeah. in a 64 Harley Street. Yeah. But there was always a sense of this would where it would happen. To yeah. me. So, so like my first move was geographical. Yeah. I thought if I'm here, then if anything's going to happen, I'll be on the spot. <laughs> I'll be here. I'll be ready for it. Um, and then, of course, I went to drama school. Yes, you know. and you got a scholarship. Yeah, I just got on with being a theatre actor. Yeah, yeah. And by the time my film break came, I was sort of adjusted, really. I was sort of resigned to a life in the theatre. Yeah. To have been um, a young man at the start of the 60s yeah. in London, yeah. there, was, there was no better place to be, really. Yeah. Let's talk about the part of Billy Budd. How surprised were you that you got it? Well, I was... Flabbergasted, really. <laughs> I said, oh, they must be really scraping the bottom of the barrel, you know, if they want to see me. And he said, oh, they are. They've seen every other young actor in England. I didn't have any thought at all that I would ever get the part. But you knew that the character was a sort of naive young man? And so yes, so. I had heard about the opera. Yeah. And I knew that the character was a great sort of innocent. Yes. And so they were looking for a new person? Yes, Ustinov wanted a new person. He'd been offered lots of people to play the part, but he didn't want that. He wanted a face that had never been seen before in order to make it convincing. The scene we're about to look at is the famous scene on Dock at Night. Tell us about that. And it was a long scene. It, and in fact, it was a scene that Ustinov used for the test. So I had done the scene in the film test. And when we came to shooting it, um, Robert Krasker, who was, you know, the most brilliant, in my opinion, black and white cameraman, did the third man. He lit it for one take, and I think it was sort of between seven and nine minutes, was just one take. Good evening. Will it be all right if I stay topside a bit to watch the water? I suppose the handsome sailor may do many things forbidden to his messmates. She's calm tonight, isn't it? Calm and peaceful. You've made a good impression on the captain, Billy Bud. You have a pleasant way with you. Oh, thanks, sir. If you wish to make a good impression on me, too, however, you will need to curb your tongue. Now, sir? <laughs> Not now. Can it be that you really don't understand my words? 
Is it ignorance or irony that makes you speak so simply? Uh, it must be ignorance, sir, because I don't understand the other word. Terence, I'm just going to stop it there for a wee second. What did you feel when you first saw these big cinemascope close-ups of yourself on the screen? Um, well, it was, it was sort of overwhelming, really, because I knew that I, I wanted a life in film. And I knew that to have a life in film, I would, it had to work in the close-up. You know, for me, I knew enough about cinema to know that cinema was close-ups. Mm -hmm. And I had to be able to take a close-up. And when I saw my first close-ups, I mean, I saw they worked, you know. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was a miracle. I didn't really think, um, I didn't really take credit for it. I was just one of those lucky guys that the camera loved, you know, because the camera sort of minimized the coarser features and emphasized the finer features. So it was a, it was an, it was a wonderful moment for me, you know. And what about the reaction to this film? You got an Oscar nomination. Uh, did your life change an awful lot? Yeah, I mean, everything changed. I was projected into another octave, really. And, and there was a sense that, there is always a sense that you can't quite believe it. It's like, fame is like walking into a room where a woman has been with an incredible perfume. That is, you can almost grasp it, but you can't. So on the morning that I woke up, when I, when I was famous, um, when the news hit, and the phone rang, and I, I, I sort of really expected it to be Bridget Bardot, you know? <laughs> and it was my mother, you know? And so that was the, f the, the kind of first... That was the first kind of crashing of the great illusion. Yeah. yeah. After Billy Budd, in the next three years, uh, you didn't actually do all that many movies. Uh, you did The Collector with William Wyler, the great William Wyler, who directed Ben-Hur and everything. But it seemed as if you were quite choosy in what you did. Why was that? Well, at the end of the filming of Billy Bard, um, you must understand Ustinov was the first kind of wise man that had taken an interest in me and actually kind of uh, gave me any advice, you know, showbiz advice. And he took me aside and he said, look, I think we've done something special here and lots of people will want to cash in on it and you'll be offered lots of things. But if you do good things, good things will come to you and you know because I was so in awe of him I maybe overdid that a bit because in fact what happened was that I began to get a bit gun shy you know and I and I, and I turned down things that I should have done actually I turned down wonderful things you turned down Alfie I turned down Alfie which you'd done on stage yes I turned down the great Josh Logan I turned down the king in Camelot you know mm. I turned down Once Upon a Time in the West, Harmonica. Did you? Mm. The Charles Bronson role? Yeah. And I'm not proud of those things. I mean, I'm sort of ashamed of those things because I turned them down for the wrong reasons. Mm. You know, I turned them down because I was actually fearful. But I was telling myself that I was being choosy. Well, let's, let's uh, jump forward till 1967, one of the films you did, except Far From the Madding Crowd. Mm. Now, you told me this is your mum's favourite of yours. Yes. It's also my mum's favourite oh, of yeah, yours. Yeah, now, yeah. why do women love this film so much, would you say? I think that, uh, I think Hardy is a really, uh, you know, he's a really romantic writer, and, and his, his stories are for the, the true romantics. Mm. And I think, um, I think, women are sort of more romantic than men at the end of the day yeah. but julie christie's character in this film and this clip we're about to see what's interesting is she goes for the man who is most violent towards her isn't that right we're about to look at the famous mm. fencing mm. scene so she's kind of masochist now why well, would why identify with that well listen there's a lot of women like bad boys you know <laughs> mm. obviously my mother was one of them your mother was one of them yeah. Um, just before we look at the clip, tell me something about the producer, Joe Yanni. Joe Yanni, I think Joe Yanni was uh, wonderful. I mean, I miss Joe Yanni because he, Joe Yanni was like one of a very rare breed. You know, he was a creative producer. Yeah. 
and there's not many of those around. There's never many of those around. And I did three movies for Joe Yanni. You know, I did Poor Cow, I did Madden Crowd, and I did Modesty Blaze. So it was a wonderful kind of working relationship. And he was like Mr. 60s cinema in a way. He produced so many of those great movies, often quite women's movies. Yes, in a yes, way, and he found wonderful directors. You yeah. know, he gave wonderful directors chances. Yeah. And, uh, and he was a real, he loved film, yeah. you know, and um, as opposed to, you know, a lot of producers who love money. You know? mm. Okay, let's look at the clip. First, I'll show you the cuts. Cut one, as if you were sowing corn. Cut two, as if you were hedging. Cut three, as if you were reaping. And four, as though you were threshing. And from the left, one, two, three, four. Now I'll show you how they look in action. Stand up. You're the enemy, right? No! You're not scared, are you? No. Because if you're scared, I can't perform. I promise I won't touch you. Don't move. Is it very sharp? No, I've got no edge at all. Hold still. Schlesinger had discovered that cavalrymen at that point were not left-handed. And so I had to, and I am a natural lefty, so I'd had to learn all that saber stuff with my right hand. When we started, I was really proficient. I felt really comfortable with the saber. I'd also built a very good relationship with Nicholas Rogue. So cinematographer. I yeah, I didn't get on too well with Schlesinger. And I heard that he pushed you in that scene to slice so close to her face that you almost touched her face. Or I did, did, I did. He, he just kind of, um, he saw that I was very adept with a, with a saber. And during the scene where I slice a piece off her hair, he kept saying, surely you can get closer than that, surely you can get closer than that. And at a certain point, I actually slashed and I felt the sword hit something. And she, she was, I mean, Christie's a real trooper. Like she didn't, she didn't move, and I nearly passed out. You know, because I, I knew I'd hit her face. You know, and in fact, I'd cut the skin, and I just touched the bone. You know, but like an eighth of an inch shorter, I'd have probably broke her jaw because they're very, they're very heavy. Those Victorian sabers. You know, and I hope Schlesinger felt really guilty about. I don't think so. I mean, he used the shot. You know, I mean that the shot where I hit her is the shot that he used. You know. Judging from uh, one of your autobiographies, it sounds as if this was an not you weren't happy making this film at all, uh, which is a surprise in some ways because you were a big star and you had fallen in love with Gene Shrimpton, and I think you were already going out with Gene Shrimpton at this time. So why were you unhappy? The feeling that I had was that really Schlesinger saw Sergeant Troy as a different archetype. Um, he saw him as an archetype that I wasn't. And I think it was one of those occasions where Joe Yanni really wanted me in it. And I had the feeling that Yanni sort of hoisted me on Schlesinger. Mm -hmm. That's understandable, of course, but if I can be honest, I wanted, when I was reading your book, I wanted to shake you because there you were with Shrimpton and you didn't confide in her. It sounds as if you didn't discuss your unhappiness with her. As far as my work is concerned, I'm a, I'm a kind of... Um, I'm a kind of stoical kind of person, really. Mm. It's just, I sort of deal with those things myself. And I guess that's the same, I'm the same now. I mean, I, if I'm in trouble on a movie, it's something that I feel I have to solve. It's, it's part of the performance. It's part of the way I access my own ability is by addressing those difficulties. 
and I never really, I've rarely ever taken anybody on a film location with me because it's sort oh, of... A partner, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I, I saw once Arthur Ashe in um, Schiphol Airport and all he had was his racket. And I totally identified with that. The next film uh, that I've got a clip of is Poor Cow. This seems to me, in a way, the first time that you started to push the boundaries into sort of non-mainstream type of cinema. Uh, in fact, its story is quite similar to Far From the Madden Crowd. It's about a woman who wants to in some way find joy through a series of men. But it's a very different film. How is it different from Far From the Madden Crowd? Well, it was completely... It was at the other end of, of the system, really. And it was Joe Yanni again. And when I finished Far From the Madden Crowd, Joe Yanni said, look, I have this movie. It's a very small movie. I think the director's really brilliant. Um, it's not a big part. It's a little part, but it's sort of experimental. The director, he's, of course, Ken Loach. Ken Loach. Yes. He's very clever. I said, well, what's clever about him? He said, well, he's, he kind of improvises stuff. I said, where's the script? Well, you see, there's not really a script. So, <laughs> you just kind of... He just kind of tells you things before the take, and I just thought, well, that sounds really fun, you know? Because so far you'd played basically, I think, sort of symbolic and archetypal characters, and here was a really fresh, ordinary bloke. Yeah, there was an ordinary spiv gangster. Yeah. You know? and, and it was very exciting because Ken Loach, you know, was the only director I think I've ever worked with who worked with two cameras simultaneously. So Carol was lit with her camera, and I was lit with my camera. Yeah. So you didn't get that jarring in very intimate scenes where you stop and the camera is moved and stuff. And Ken Loach couldn't really do it any other way because it was improvisation. And he would tell me one thing and he'd tell her another thing. So Did you not feel incredibly manipulated by that style of directing? Well, you, you didn't... No, I, I mean, because what was happening was this incredible... It was real in the moment stuff. You know, the camera was turning. Mm. You were in that space between action and cut, you know. You're like Formula One. You know, your mind's turning so quickly. Everything seems to be happening in slow motion, you know. And he did it again and again, you know. You get into a scene, you think you were doing one thing. She'd think she mm. would be doing something completely different. So it was very dangerous but exciting. Brilliant. And the scene we're about to see is in Wales when you're on holiday mm. and she chucks the soup at you. Now, we need to know one thing. Did you know she was going to chuck the soup no, at you? No, no, no. That's the point. I'm suddenly covered with Irish stew. You know? <laughs> yeah. So that's what he had on camera. He told me something else. He told me something completely different. And he said, oh, throw the soup. <laughs> well, let's see. And what mm. I love about this one in particular is her little reaction shot. You can see she's kind of, yeah. you know, she's embarrassed and like a kid that she's throwing the soup yeah, at yeah. you. Let's have a look at it. It's lovely. Now oh, then, Jono. Don't give it to him. It's too hot. What would you give it me for? You said that's for Johnny. Didn't look, you? leave him alone. There's yours. You have to eat it with a spoon because I ain't got any forks. Mm. But in your soul. Why don't you leave me alone? You had the salt last. I don't know where it is. Oh. What's the matter with it? Bleeding air in it. That's what's the matter with it. Well, it's not mine. It's lovely, isn't it? Your air in tin soup. Fantastic. It's not my air. Must have got in at the factory. Yeah. That's the best tin stew steak there is, this. Yeah, say that again. <laughs> well, make it yourself, then. Oh, that's <laughs> bleeding great, isn't it? Stew. Yes. Great soup all over the place. Look, there's that shop, isn't it? Fantastic. Well, get something then and sit there bleating laughing. Tell me a cloth or something. Well, you should never go at me about it then. You asked for that, you did. Yeah, I didn't want it over me bleating head. <laughs> uh, the next clip we've got is from your Western Blue. Now, it was shot by Stanley Cortez. Stanley the Baron Cortez. Why was he called that? I don't know. That was on his chair. Stanley yeah. the Baron Cortez. And he shot the great Orson Welles film, Magnificent Ambersons. Yeah. And he shot Night of the Hunter. That yeah, he shot picture. Charlie Lawton's movie, yeah. What was he like? 
Well, he was, he was, I thought he was wonderful. He was a kind of tragic figure. Um, and what had happened was that um, it was that blue was the vehicle for Robert Redford. And at the last moment, Robert Redford had dropped out. And so the film had to be put back. And by the time we got it going again, there wasn't a really great DP around. And, uh, and Stanley Cortez had been out of work for a long time. You know, it was like his last shot at a world title kind of thing. And he was very nervous. And he did take an incredible long time lighting stuff. And we got into trouble, you know what I mean? I mean, the film did go over budget. And it was a lot to do with Stanley. Um, but, of course, I was loving it because I just... I, I could see what he was doing. And he was one of those cameramen who lit... Um, with a lot of small lights. Mm -hmm. So he could sort of say, if when you say that line, you move your head there, I'll get a kick in your eyes. You know what I mean? He was like a watchmaker, really. It's inc and it pays off so much, it's incredibly beautiful. It's incredible. Film. I think it's like the most beautiful film I've ever been in, yeah. you know, from, a, from a, the way it's lit. And I read, I think, that it was designed by this guy, Hal Pereira, who had designed, like, Vertigo and yeah. Rear Window and yeah. Double Indemnity. What yeah. an incredible team of people. Yeah. That was, for me, that was exciting in, in those years, you know, the, the golden years mm -hmm. that, that I worked. I just had that feeling that I was within this sort of golden circle of people. You know, there's a word in the East called satsang, which is, um, and they like certain illnesses and certain mental conditions can only be cured by satsang. And satsang is the company of the noble. And I think of my 60s films as that. I was, I was ennobled by the company that I was with. You know. mm. The tragedy of Blue was it was long before its time. You know, it was a real kind of thinking man's Western. Mm. Blues like schizophrenic character was in part portrayed by the fact that he had this sort of white blonde hair and this black beard. And in this scene, he's, he hasn't spoken. And the character, that, that the family into which he's fallen, with the great Carl Malden and the wonderful Joanna Pettit, they realize that he's not a Mexican. They realize that he's a, a white person, you know. And um, this is just her way of, and they can't get him to speak. And this is her way of getting him to speak, by shaving him, like, very near his jugular. <laughs> OK, let's watch and wince. Now, I think you should know I'm not a woman of minor achievement, and I add to my list daily. I cook, sew, undertake all the normal female activities. And in addition, I handle a plow as well as a piano, a little log and make a quick time, and oh, I'm just about as good as any man, huh, Pop? Oh, oh, did I hurt you? Oh, no, I am fearfully sorry. But with all my accomplishments, I have... Now, did I do it again? Now, how can I apologize? Well, except to say that uh, I've never shaved a man before, so if my hand should falter and my fingers slip, I'll do it. <laughs> Once again, the director's going for your eyes, mm. aren't they? Um, in, your, in your autobiographies, you use a phrase, you say you were in a miasma of misery at the time of making this film, and uh, you were actually taking um, a lot of marijuana in the morning and the afternoon, I think, as far as I remember from the book. Why were you so miserable at this time? The fact was, Shrimpton had left me, like, the day before I started the movie. So it wasn't, I wasn't in best shape to start a movie. You know, there was nothing I could do about it. I mean, I was signed to do the movie, and she'd gone. And there I was, you know, in this kind of desert, you know, making this film. So I was really, I was just doing all I could to kind of hold myself together, you know. Mm -hmm. And do you feel you were facing up to, you know, your sadness, or, or were you escaping in some way just into a picture doing something? Yeah, I was escaping into the picture, really. That's what I was doing. I mean, I, 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 I saw that. I, I was aware of sort of incredible timing of it. Because given my own choice, it was the last thing in the world that I wanted to be doing, was 
you know, out there in the desert with a load of strange people making a movie mm. with this kind of a heartache. Um, but it was a fact. And there was part of me that was thinking, I have to do this. Um, how can I best do it, you know? How can I kind of siphon off some of this misery into this movie? The next clip we've got is from the Fellini movie that you ah, did. Ah. No, oh, why, do you, why do you say, ah, ah, like that? Oh, yeah, no, because it's landmark, you know? I yes. mean, I, I regard my career, um, you know, if I look at my career, the long arc of my career, there was like before Fellini and there was after Fellini. So it was a real kind of uh, hallmark picture for me. Yeah. And why, I mean, it's an it's a, it's a absolutely great picture, but uh, why is it such a hallmark in your career? Although I love cinema and I, and I was totally preoccupied with the magic of cinema, there was part of me that couldn't quite believe that it was all happening to me. And that caused a kind of a, a sort of an underlayer fear. And so I always approach my movies in this condition, like rather fearful. And the fear was kind of, was partly to do with, you know, am I really up to this? Or am I suddenly going to get found out? So that was the condition I found myself in, you know, when I started work with Fellini. And it was immediately after Blue. I'd gone to see Fellini. My hair, you know, was growing out. I had like dark roots and peroxided hair. And Fellini loved that. <laughs> oh, it's schizophrenic. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. I love, I love. He's, Don't you think I should dye my hair? No, 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 no. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's, yeah. <laughs> and, and partly working with him and knowing that. You know, here was a man who was one of the all-time great movie directors, you know. And he had chosen me. And he wouldn't let me go home, you know. Why? Why you want to go to... You have a mistress? No, I don't have a mistress. Why you want to go back to London? Well, me, me, not. I haven't got any clothes. We'll buy you clothes. We'll buy you clothes. You stay here with me. I said, okay. The first take in the movie is in Rome Airport. So it's kind of madness, because the airport's not closed, you know. Fellini's got all these assistants, he's pointing out passengers, they're grabbing them into the film, you know. I'm brought onto the set from my trailer outside the airport, and I'm stood there, and nobody speaks English, and I don't speak any Italian, and I'm realizing they're going to go for the shot, you know. And I look at Fellini and I say, I say, you know, you can. And he looked like, like one of his puppets had suddenly come to life, you know. <laughs> I was calling him, and he comes through the lights. Tell us, que cosa, dimmi, dimmi. I said, listen, I'm an English actor. I'm in Rome for the first time. I'm working for this great Italian maestro. This is my first take. I want some direction. Fair enough. Listen. Last night, you was playing Shakespeare. You was in Olvik playing Shakespeare. It's your very last performance. After the show, you go to a party. It's really a hoji. It's drinking whiskey, snorting cocaine, smoking ashish, fucking, lots of fucking. You fucking some blonde, some big black man fucking you. Lots of sex, lots of drinking, lots of ashish. All night, fucking smoking, drinking. Early this morning, someone drive you to the airport. Just before they put you on the plane, they give you a big tab of LSD. Now you're here. So I never asked him again, right? That's <laughs> direction enough for 10 movies, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Given this direction, let's see what resulted. Hey, Mr. Demet, smile, please. Look over here. No. Right, no. Toby, here. Make a law with your hand,
did you come here? How did this lead to the next film that we've got a clip from, which I think is one of the best films ever made, Pasolini's Teorema? Of all the films I've made, it's the one that I'm asked to speak about most. Mm. You know, there's not a year goes by without somebody coming to me and saying, I'm writing a book about him, I'm making a movie about him, can you talk to me about him? I met this wonderful Canadian director, Adam Igoyen. Oh, yes. And Adam Igoyen said, it's my absolute favourite yes. movie of all yes. time, you know, and he just wanted to say, how did you do that? Yes. I had been called back to Rome by Fellini to do a post-sync, because he does quite heavily post-syncing. He, As you can see there. Yeah, he makes two films, you know, there's his visual film and then he, and he sticks on to them like a radio play. So his sound is, you know, 50% of the movie, really. So I had gone to Rome to do the post-sync and my brother Chris, who was, you know, discovered The Who and was having this very successful career in rock and roll, really wanted to meet Fellini. And so I'd taken Chris with me and we hung out there with Federico. And on one afternoon, I saw the amazing Silvana Mangano. There she is. I was looking at, you know, this woman I'd been in love with since Bitter Rice. You know? Yeah. And my brother was saying, Pasolini's great, Pasolini. I was saying, what about her, you know, what about Silvana Mangano? And then after that meeting, my brother told me who Pasolini was, you know, and she spoke to Pasolini about me. So that was how I came to be in the movie. Scusami. Scusami. More, more. <laughs> <laughs> there you were, making love to the woman that oh, you admired in the oh, cinema. Oh, <laughs> great moment. Uh, yeah, so tell us <clears throat> the story and the character. It's extremely unusual. Well, Pasolini, in fact, really only spoke to me once. And Pasolini said, this is the story of the film. A boy comes to Milan. He stays with a family. In the family is the father, the mother, the son, the daughter, and the maid. The boy makes love to all of them and leaves. This is your part. <laughs> I, yeah. Sounds, <laughs> sounds like me. <laughs> he said to me, he's a boy with a divine nature. And that was the clue I had. And I thought to myself, OK, he's a Catholic. He's gay, he's a Marxist, he's a poet, he's an Italian, he's a very complicated guy. How would he view an enlightened creature? The thing that would appeal to him would be judge not. So that was what I tried to do. I tried to keep my character, I tried to keep myself completely in the moment. I think, I think you've got actually to the nub of... Um why this is such a great film in a way, because there's you, you're in it, you're not judging, you're a, just a presence, as you say, and yet we know that Pasolini in some way hated the bourgeoisie, or at least felt that they would inevitably decline. Yeah. My feeling was that he wasn't really a filmmaker. You know, there's no, like, you can't talk about how he shot stuff. He put the camera here, he yeah. moved it here, he moved it there, he moved it's it there. It's very crude, Cut. technically, isn't yes. it? Yes. But he was a poet who was using film to write poetry. We're at the late 60s now, and you left the film industry in a way. Why did you do that? I think, really, it was two things. One, I was sort of emotionally not in very good shape. And when the 60s ended, because I, I'd been so heavily identified with the 60s, my sort of career ended as well. In other words, I wasn't being offered the jobs that I'd become accustomed to. I was definitely second division. And I thought to myself, well, 
I've had 10 years. I've, I've given my, the last 10 years of my life to filmmaking. I'll get back to some of my original wishes, you know, and I had always wanted to travel. I'd always wanted to go to the East. And I thought, nothing's happening for me. I'm just being offered, like, Cockney lorry drivers, you know. I'll, I'll go and do that. So though I never imagined that I would be out of the business for so long, um, years just went by, you know. And, and um, occasionally I would run out of money or somebody would come up to me with, with a, some sort of fun project, you know. That, so I wasn't looking at myself like a sort of professional artist, you know. You did some very interesting films in the 70s, however, and we've got a clip here, I think a very rare clip, of a film called Who Man. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it. I don't know anybody who's ever seen mm. it. Not a running relay. Too strong. Too cold to get... Program. Rescue crews. Can you do something to help him? It was basically trying to kill me. You know. yeah. It was taking me to the most dangerous places on earth, you know, and filming me. <clears throat> and it was a kind of mad, like, science fiction film that was really for, like, five drag queens and Einstein, you know, and I think that's all who really saw it. That sounds like a later film, you know. <laughs> go, go, go. But it was a rare, I mean, it was a fun job, you know, it took me, we lived in a volcano in Ethiopia, you know, we worked here in this mad tide that comes in at the speed of a galloping horse. How, did, how is that done? Because there's a tide coming in from all directions. Yes, it's just one is of those... Is that faked or is that... No, 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 it's a natural phenomenon in the sea, just off Morsem Shah. It happens like that. All the things happen, they're all natural phenomena. And that, is that blue screen, is that a no. fake? Well, no. you're hanging out of an airplane? Yeah, I'm hanging out of a helicopter. And, I'm, and here I'm living next to a volcano. There were a lot of shots where I had to lay next to it. And in fact, in one sequence, I said to the cameraman, like, don't stop shooting unless I'm really in danger because I don't want to do this more than once. You know? mm. And they didn't stop. And when when they finished the take, a piece of lava had burnt itself right through my trousers. Fortunately, the part that my leg wasn't in, because you know, it was spitting up all the time. I love this shot. This is how I imagine you through the 70s. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's great. That's Walking in the wilderness. Absolutely. <laughs> so the next film I've got a clip of is Superman. Right. You go from... Uh, these exchange experiences you're having your East back into the sort of center of international big budget cinema. Finally, General Zod, once trusted by this council, charged with maintaining the defense of the planet Krypton itself, chief architect of this intended revolution and author of this insidious plot to establish a new order amongst us with himself as absolute ruler. You have heard the evidence. The decision of the council will now be heard. Guilty. 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 The vote must be unanimous, Dorel. It has therefore now become your decision. You alone will condemn us if you wish, and you alone will be held responsible by me. The thing about Brando is, you can't know about Brando unless you meet him, because he's just the funniest guy that ever lived. You know? Intentionally? He's just funny. He's just one of those guys who's like Tommy Cooper, you know, he, he says something. <laughs> and I've never heard of being compared to Tommy Cooper. Before. No, but you know how yes. Tommy Cooper is hysterical, you yes. know what I mean? Yes. And, he, and Brando is hysterical, like he can't help be funny. First time he came on the set, he said, Terence, uh, have you read this? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, why, Marlon? Haven't you read your script? No, no, I haven't read it. Though. I said, why? Why haven't you read it, Marlon? Well, you know, they're paying me a lot of money, and if I read it, you know, it might be for shit, and I might not want to do it, you know, but I need the money. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to take a big jump now uh, up to the early 1990s mm -hmm. and a film that you made for another director with a very intense visual style, very personal visual style, Pilar Miro. 
And what's the story of this film, Prince of Shadows? It's basically, it's during the time when Franco was wiping out half of Spain. The partisans believe and have believed for years that there is a kind of a traitor within their movement. In this scene, the character that I play, who's called Darman, finally understands that this man who was his greatest friend is in fact not dead, hasn't been tortured, has been tortured, but has gone over to, to Franco's side. And he, in fact, is the traitor. And this is kind of the exposure of him. I invented a glorious death, and I wanted to know just how you felt thinking of your old friend tied to a chair and shot. Did it hurt you? It did hurt. I thought you were the best. I'm sorry not to have come up to your expectations. You'll pay for this, Bolivia. You'll pay for every comrade you tortured, for every free man you threw into jail. Silence! So, the truth does hurt. Is that what I'm doing here? So that someone can finally tell you the truth? Aren't you amazed by what you've done? By what you're still doing every day? <laughs> Shut him up! Shut him up! Be quiet! Be quiet! Silence! So, Terence, if you have an image, it's a very well-dressed, a very dapper, quite sophisticated gentleman. Here's what you did next. I'm going to stay looking at you. Look at this. I remember seeing that in Cannes and at the film festival, and someone said, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Terence Stamp, and you walked <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, God, it was a silly movie. Yeah. Why did you decide to do a silly movie? Um, I just felt I was being kind of... Well, that, that what you just said, you know, that I was thought of as, you know? I was thought of uh, this, like, chilling English villain yeah. or this kind of... Uh, androgynous kind of saintly figure and and I just wanted to I was looking to do things that were fun really yeah but at the end of the day it's a film it's visual you have to start with practicalities you know so I had a full body wax and I got high-heeled shoes made and I put false nails on and so I did all kind of all that stuff you know and I read that you once uh, saw Princess Diana take an earring off and put it on the table or something like that, and you copied that, etc. Well, I didn't really cop. I mean, I don't really work like that, but in a scene, my ear started to hurt, and I just went to take it off, and I had a kind of a, like a flash of her doing it, you know. But as I say, they're things that happen in that special energy, you know, when, when the film is actually turning. I read that you wanted to look as beautiful as possible in this picture, but secretly they were lighting you from the side and trying to make you look as ugly as possible. Well, I didn't want to look. I just imagined that um, because the character was, at the end of the day, the character was very sympathetic, you know. It was a kind of a hymn towards people that are sexually ambivalent. So I just assumed that I was being made to look good, you know. Mm. So I imagined I was looking like, you know, Lauren Bacall or Candice Bergen or <laughs> Mimi Van Doren or somebody. And it's not quite. And, then, <laughs> and I saw the film for the first time at that can showing, you yeah. know, which was like the whole of cinema world was there. And the curtain came up and there I was like this old tomcat, you know. It was a terrible 
moment. Yeah. And um, I know people who have seen Priscilla and have said, where's Terence Stamp in it? I didn't see him. What do you think of that? <laughs> um, extremely flattered, you know. And as a matter of fact, time when people come up and say, oh, you know, I love Priscilla, I love Priscilla, I always say, well, I'm flattered you recognise me in stride. <laughs> Now, one of the big themes in your books is uh, your relationship with Jean Shrimpton, but with more w with generally with women, and you're trying to understand women in some way, see the world through their eyes. And then here you are in a comic role, mostly, uh, quite literally trying to see the the world through the eyes of a woman. Does that, is that was that any, any time in your head? The character of Bernadette is essentially very profound, because what do you do? if you're a woman and you're in the wrong body. You know, what do you do? Look, please, everyone, tomorrow's going to be a little tough. Please don't make it any harder than it has to be. We're only teasing. We won't open our mouths until you give the word. Then it's open season. And in this scene, I got very close to how I'd envisage this character of Bernadette. Mm -hmm. You know, She's got all her knees together. Yes, but really, like, being a woman in the eyes of a real heterosexual man, which I think is a highlight in Bernadette's life. Another piece of cake, Bob? Uh, <laughs> nah. Oh. So, tell me about you. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I want to ask you, you have a role in one of the new Star Wars films. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us? I hear you didn't sign a secrecy agreement, is no, that right? We so you were, can tell us everything? Well, I can't tell you everything because we weren't given a full script. You know? oh, yeah. I was just given my few pages. You know? yeah. um, I have a feeling it's going to be really extraordinary. It was a very good feeling on the set. I was with Ewan McGregor, Liam Nielsen, and a heavenly girl. Who is, it's just a real amazing cinema animal called uh, Natalie Portman. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's like a 16-year-old Audrey Hepburn. And when I finished my part, and it was time for me to leave the set, and I knew the others were going on to do another three months, I was really sort of jealous, you know. I, I just wanted to be in for the whole trip. Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I don't know much about it. You used a phrase there, uh, be on for the whole trip. One of my favourite things that you said was uh, films are best when they become kind of trips. Mm. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that to make a film on location is tremendously difficult. Um, and what happens in order to access that extra energy, you know, the individual egos have to be put aside. And when the individual egos are put aside, there's this kind of fusion of energy, you know, where two and two become seven. And that's like a trip. When you finish a really difficult movie that's been like 12 weeks of sheer murder in the jungles of the Philippines or something, you, you, you come off it sort of exalted. And I think that's why I do movies, that feeling. Terence, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. See the man in action here on BBC Two, far from the madding crowd next, and at 12.30, Blue. And I took away